Alexander Hagen. I'm the CEO of a medium-sized tech company in Silicon Valley. Previously, I was a financial analyst and a financial journalist. Tonight, I want to speak to you about two groups of candidates that have obtained office in the U.S. House election analysis. One group is 10 national security candidates that ran under the Democratic Party and one group is 10 progressives. And I want to compare these two groups because they both ended up securing 10 seats in slightly different manners. So the group that you see here, and this uh, document I will have a uh, link to in the bottom of this video, are the 10 candidates as identified in a number of articles, one of which I think I can find for you right now, uh, this one here. This one is a reprint of an article from the World Socialist website, I guess it's uh, what it's called, WSWS.org. See, I Democrats have balance sheet of the primaries. So these aren't merely uh, people with a military background, but people with extensive backgrounds that would suggest they might vote right of the Republicans on national security issues. So they could potentially be sort of stealth candidates. And what's interesting about them, they ran a lot of people. Uh, they ran a total of um, 32 or 33 candidates, as it was broken out here. And what's interesting is of the 10 candidates that did win, uh, nine uh, flipped their districts. So these are people that on national security policies are likely to vote right of or as right as Republicans. One would hope not. One has to look objectively, and the information to the right is laid out here that goes over each of their resumes. Uh, so from the Clinton Democrats' point of view, this is great. They were eroding in suburban districts running these military-industrial CIA types uh, in these races. So of the, ten, of the 33 races they ran, uh, 10 were successful, nine of which flipped Republicans. So that means that they, they were not competitive uh, dealing with a Democratic or liberal districts. They were only competitive in the Republican districts, so this is also a drawback for them. Now, the Bernie group that we have here, um, we have uh, three incumbents, Pramila Jayapal, Raul Grijalva, Tulsi Gabbard, and then these are the newcomers, Chewy Garcia in Illinois, ja uh, Jamie Raskin in Maryland, now, um, Chewy is definitely replacing somebody who would have voted to the right of Chewy. So this is uh, an improvement in our representation in Congress for a more progressive Congress. Some of these people might be replacing other old progressives since uh, Jamie, uh, so we have to go through and look. So Jamie Raskin uh, replaced Van Holland. Uh, Van Holland was fairly conservative on my uh, scaling system. So I have a scaling system here on totalitarian voting patterns. Uh, and, um, you know, the, the real progressive people in Congress is only a group of 20 or 30, and they aren't all Democrats either. Like Justin Amash is a Palestinian-American Republican, and he votes left of Democrats on surveillance and war. Uh, so um, getting back to the uh, Bernie Kratt analysis, uh, so then we have... Uh, Two uh, Muslim Americans, as you know, a uh, Somali and a Palestinian, Rashida Tlaib and Ilhan Omar. Uh, I think Rashida is a democratic socialist or endorsed by DSA. That's another group we have to analyze is how DSA, uh, Democratic Socialist America, has won five or ten small races in the country. That's for sure, probably more than that. They're candidates. Um, they are running within the Democratic Party, by and large. Uh, then we have two uh, Native American ladies. Only one was endorsed by our revolution, so we have to look at the other. So again, this is not the entire progressive movement here. These are the ones specifically endorsed by our revolution who won. Uh, then Deb Holland, who uh, won in New Mexico. That's a Native American lady. Ocasio, of course, we all know about Alejandra Ocasio-Cortez in New York. And then uh, a nice win was Veronica Escobar, but that was a given. She was occupying Beto O'Rourke seat and then Pramila Jaipal. Um, so how many of these were hard fought? You know, um, about 40% of them, we could say. Um, 
So uh, now let's look in more detail the National Security Democrats and uh, who they replace. So this can replace somebody who has a severely bad score on uh, this voting record on totalitarian laws. Um, this guy's score goes down in the minus eight area, so it's horrendous. Uh, so this guy couldn't be any worse on those issues. So uh, I wanted to make a few points. Um, so these military industrial candidates have won, won almost exclusively in Republican districts. As such, they do not at this point pose a threat to the progressive wing if they run against them, unless they vote as viciously as their Republican predecessors, who we can assume, we can assume this will be the case in matters of national security, but we can hope that they're more uh, amenable to things like Medicare for all uh, and um, regulation of corporations uh, uh, on the, uh, the, the domestic front. We can assume they're going to be more progressive domestically and hawkish uh, internationally. Um, but it might be that they're just hawkish in both cases, or they might be slight improvement on the previous incumbent. Um, now, you know, the question we're going to have to ask is, are, are, what are these candidates going to vote like? So of the Bernie crats, are they going to oppose escalation of tensions with Russia? Are they going to uh, pressure and hold Israel accountable to sit down and discuss a proper two-state solution, ending the main irritant in the Middle East, the Palestinian question? All the things are changing. Um, ending aid to the petromonarchy, such as Saudi Arabia, and uh, and in the, so doing uh, uh, an aid for us is to sell them hundreds of billions of dollars worth of weapons. This is really huge and was never occurred before. Before 2005, there was tiny amounts of arms shipments going to these countries compared to what we're seeing now in terms of dollar amounts. Uh, dollar amounts have gone up by 10 an order of magnitude by tenfold. And uh, so by supporting the military industrial systems in those countries, training their pilots, training their uh, interrogators, training their intelligence agencies, we're enabling them to roam, to go out and wreak havoc and to invade using both conventional armies and also using asymmetric force such as Al Qaeda in Syria and in Libya. Uh, so we can, un uh, these national security ha candidates, okay, another question is, are these guys going to vote for the National uh, Defense Authorization Act or the National Intelligence Authorization Act, which have had, are extremely bloated? Are they going to support a system of disarmament globally where we can shrink military budgets and focus our money on uh, things like education and health care, feeding our people, housing them, uh, you know, things that actually produce real value? Um, so we can understand from the Clinton centrist third way DLC perspective why the Bernie progressive uh, candidates, the Bernie progressives are a pain because they have to spend money defending against them because of their system of loyalty. Um, and uh, whereas on the other hand, we're seeing these uh, Republican types running in these swing districts and flipping them, they're having spasms of ecstasy because these people are expanding the party to the right. So, you know, the system we have now, there's a, the reason these Congress people are in forever is that there's a wait your turn mentality. Um, and uh, when seats come up, there's sort of a shuffling internally for who's going to buy for them. And of course, and they go from Congress into state office. And uh, so there's a number of different places that they can seek to get into if um, Congress isn't turning over. Um, and I guess Congress is the ultimate prize. Um, so they have a system of uh, rewarding loyalty, and so only uh, very heavily funded people uh, would be uh, would be expected to run against the uh, current incumbents because the money from the coffers of the Democratic uh, uh, Central Committee uh, might be needed to defend these uh, Democratic primary challenges rather than saving the money to spend strictly in the uh, general election against presumably a Republican opponent. However, in 2020, it's going to be quite different. I think the Bernie Kratz, the uh, real progressives, will be able to flip more districts because um, they'll have the coattails if we have an articulate Bernie-like figure leading the charge. 
Uh, and we've got a little taste of what happened in 2018 that's wrong. In 2018, uh, I have a statement about that that I'll get to. I would agree with others that Democrats appearing more focused on going after Trump over his intrigues rather than clearly putting forward a progressive agenda created this situation where we got the minimum, really, in terms of uh, the so-called blue wave, and then we had the red wall, as they were calling it now, which has really been uh, for the Trump to get a, a consolation prize of massively expanding his control of the Senate. So it's going to be much harder to peel off two uh, Republicans to block a Trump proposal than it would have been previously when it might have been 49-51 and just one or two people could make the difference. Uh, because there are some very deeply conservative uh, Democrats. Like most Democrats vote fairly conservatively. We really have two corporate parties. Uh, they, they, they can use both of them. Um, they, they, they converge on issues of keeping massive uh, monopoly cartels in place effectively, rather than breaking up too large to fail businesses in all kinds of industries. Uh, the companies, when they reach a uh, $100 billion market cap, become destructive to their own industries in many cases. It wouldn't hurt to break them up. It wouldn't reduce competitiveness, in my opinion and the opinion of many others. Um, so, instead of articulating a progressive agenda, uh, which uh, would have created uh, 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 <clears throat> a lot of pressure on special interests uh, and um, uh, exposed uh, a lot of Trump's uh, uh, agenda as being toxic for America. Instead, the Democrats and their supporters in the media have not focused on Trump's extremely damaging policies of massive military increases, which they've full-throatedly endorsed, and his massive tax cuts for the rich. Uh, but on the alternative side of the Democratic side, we don't see a clear vision being articulated about how refocusing our priorities would benefit working class everyday people. Uh, so, uh, in 2020, I think we will be able to get some uh, uh, coattails in uh, districts that are swing districts. Uh, that's my view. Uh, but we have to start organizing fairly soon. Uh, and then finally, as a, you know, Trump is watching these results. Who is he watching the results with? With the head of, uh, I think, BlackRock? Uh, Schwartzman, I think is his name. He's, he's with uh, Sheldon Adelson, who has got ultra warlike uh, uh, hawkish posture for Israel and uh, 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 advocates incredibly unfair and harsh treatment of Palestinians. Uh, Trump's principal financial backer. Uh, so he's there. And at the same time, the Democrats are all crying about Russiagate, when we have the evidence right in our eyes of what the real foreign meddling is in our election, and that's the Israel lobby. Uh, the Israel lobby, there's a movie that's been released by Electronic Intifada called The Israel Lobby, lobby that was done by Al Jazeera, that shows in black and white uh, the manipulation that's going on, uh, whereas in Russiagate, as George Galloway said, we have chimerical tales. Uh, really, if you compare the evidence, if you watch the Israel lobby and then you look at uh, of somebody uh, reasonably neutral analyzing the evidence on Russia Gate, it's like night and day. I hope this information was useful to you. Uh, as one final sign off, I would like to uh, just show you folks uh, where the um, where the districts are that flipped in this race, uh, and here they are. Looks like we had one flip in California, yes. Hill and Knight. And then who were the flip districts of those districts that were these national security candidates? We have New Jersey, two in New Jersey, one in New York, one in Colorado, one in Michigan, one in Virginia, two in Pennsylvania, oh, much more than that. We've got uh, three in Virginia. I should really uh, sort by... Michigan, New Jersey, New Jersey, New Jersey, New 
York, Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania, Texas, Virginia, Virginia, and that's it. Two in Virginia, two in New Jersey. So my name is Alexander Hagen. Uh, good night and good luck.